Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm really excited to have joining me legendary frontman and singer Michael Monroe. We're going to talk all about the new upcoming re-release of his Demolition 23 album, along with, of course, his time with Hanoi Rocks, working with Steve Stevens, Guns N' Roses, and so much more. Michael also takes out a guitar and actually sings and performs slightly for us as well. That was a lot of fun. The whole chat was great. I know you guys are going to really enjoy it. So let's jump in and let's get started. I want to start off, Michael, first off, by thanking you for joining me. And, you know, this week's exciting news, the Demolition 23 album is going to be re-released after almost 30 years, 25, 30 years. So before we talk about the album, there's going to be people that are watching and listening to this that maybe don't know about the band and how it started. So bring us back to the early 90s and how did this band get started? Well, uh it started with me and little Steven uh, uh, wanted to make an album that uh, I had wanted to make before, uh, uh, but uh, I was, I had a deal with a big label with Polygram Records, I had a, a worldwide deal and uh, they didn't allow me to use little Steven as the producer for my previous project, which really went south and uh, <laughs> ended up costing a huge amount of money and uh, it turned out uh, uh, I had to leave, I had to get off the label because I just, you know, uh, it wasn't, wasn't, uh, uh, didn't make sense to stay on because mm-hmm. I owe them. A, I ended up owing them close to a million dollars. So I was just like, Ooh. I had to get off the label. <laughs> and it took about a year till I got off the label. And then, uh, so then I called Steve and I said, Hey, I'm free. Now I can, now we can make the record I always wanted to make. <laughs> and uh, uh, Steve said, Yeah, great. Isn't that, isn't it great? One day you owe them a million, next day you don't. <laughs> <laughs> But oh. I took actually it wasn't the next day it was the, it took me a year to like get dropped but uh, so I didn't have a big record deal but still I was more I wasn't concerned about that I was uh, wanted to make a cool record and uh, Stephen and I had been yeah. talking about this for for a while and uh, uh, we had written some songs and then we really started writing uh, 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 actively writing songs and uh, putting a band together and. Uh, uh, there wasn't much of a scene in New York. Uh, it was like '93, and and that's <laughs> the end of the summer. We we came up with an idea that we we were gonna create a sort of uh, scene in New York by having uh, the, the the Cat Club, uh, which was called the Grand at the time. Uh, yep. It changed to the Grand. We had like every Monday night. We were we were, we decided to have like a, after we put the band together with Jay Henning on guitar, Sammy Alf on bass, and Jimmy Clark on drums, which was to become Demolition Twenty Three. We had uh, Michael uh, Michael Monroe and friends Monday nights at the Grand Glam Trash Punk, uh, you know uh, uh, My- Michael Monroe and friends. We had a guest every. We, we had a evening of uh, we, we, kept, we were showing like um, videos uh, of uh, until midnight. There was like a bunch of videos with uh, vintage uh, you know bands like MC Five, Again the Stooges, mm-hmm. Alice Cooper Band, the Ramones, the Dead Boys, the Damned, the Pistols, the Clash, Mutt the Hoople, Faces, Early Dave Bowie, Slade, <laughs> Sweet, all that kind of stuff. And then midnight we'd hit the stage with uh, with my band and uh, we played uh, all kinds of punk stuff, punk favorites, you know, the Dead Boys, the Damned, the Ruts, and uh, you know uh, uh, some Hanoi Rocks and some Michael Monroe. And uh, every night we had a guest come up to uh, to play with us. And uh, the first night was Joe Ramone. We played three Ramone songs, uh, mm-hmm. Big Pop, uh, Want to Be Sedated, and, and She Knows a Punk Rocker. And then we had Ian Hunter come up one 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 Monday. It was he played uh, Once Beaten Twice Shy and Roll Away the Stone, and uh, of course 
all the young dudes with the Matla Hoople and uh, Corey Clark, Warrior Soul. They were actually the last, we did, we kept this going for about 10 weeks every, every Monday night, which was the toughest night of the week. Sure. <laughs> to, to a club, but uh, it was, it was cool. You know, uh, people came down, you know, Lemmy and uh, stuff to, to, and we had uh, other guests who were like Bobby Steele, who was with the Misfits originally. So we played a couple of Misfits songs. Uh, Sebastian Bach was there like <laughs> many a night. He was like, hey, dude, let's do some Hanoi. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and he was like, all right, New York, let's hear it for Michael Monroe. I was like, oh, shh, shh, just stop playing that from my neighborhood. I can't, can't go out anymore. <laughs> Anyways, well, he's, it was fun. It was all in good fun. And, and Walter Lure came up. Uh, we played some uh, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreaker stuff. And, you know, it was a cool thing. And we kept it going for 10 weeks. And then we had the band and uh, we went into the studio to record some demos uh, at the Baby Monster. We recorded three songs. It was Dysfunctional, Hammersmith Palais, and uh, The Scum Lives On. And then uh, at the end of the year, went to the power station to record the album, which is one of the coolest, the most fun sessions I had because I had little Steven producing. I, I knew I was in good hands. And uh, yeah. Music was all well, the, the backing tracks were recorded in three days and the vocals were wow. done in two days. And, wow, uh, <laughs> amazing! Yeah, and then we mixed uh, mixed it in like one song per day, so it was like about about two weeks. The album was done, and it's still one of the best sounding albums I've you know best records I've done, one of the best ones uh, that I I think you know I think my records not faking from the old albums not faking it in demolition twenty three are some two of my my favorites. Uh, and it still sounds great. And it was remastered for this reissue. I mean, it was out in Japan and in, in Europe. Uh, it came out on um, Music for Nations label in Europe. And um, uh, I don't know uh, how much, but they probably didn't print that much. Uh, it was, it, it's was it been out of print for, was it 28 years decades, now? Decades, yeah. <laughs> decades. Yeah. yeah, for decades. So exactly. uh, Stephen owns the record. So I've been talking about it with him for for ages to uh, to you know to have it be uh, have it come out, uh, having you know put it out, and then finally now we we started doing it for real, and uh, it's never been out on vinyl. Uh, I uh, uh, we I dug out some old photos, and we had Rich Jones, who uh, was my guitarist in my band, and uh, is also uh, uh, you know done our, our artwork on my last four albums and and it's really good at that so i dug out some old photos and uh, we worked on the out did a whole new artwork for the album and there's a poster as well and uh, uh and then uh three bonus tracks uh, are the three demos, demos. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh and it's remastered most importantly it sounds better than before it's, it kicks more ass now it's the well, i've heard an advanced copy and it does it sounds amazing it really does I, so let, let, let me ask you something so you mentioned steve van zandt and obviously people know him through springsteen of course now of course years later he was on the sopranos like you said he worked with you on the not faking it record when did you first meet him and how did you first get involved with him well, I was uh, when Hanoi Rocks was breaking up, broke up in uh, the beginning of '85. I was um, in London. I really didn't have any plans, uh, and, and I was hanging out with Steve Bader's, the Dead Boys, and Lost Minute Church. He was my best friend and the only friend I really had at the time. And uh, <laughs> I used to go and feed his cat when he was on tour. And uh, then we decided to move in together to, you know, save with the rent. So uh, I lived with uh, Steve in his flat in Portobello in London, and, and Stephen came over to produce the Lords of a New Church. Uh, there was a single they were making uh, called Lord's Prayer, and uh, the B-side was Credence cover, Hey Tonight. So he came over, and I was a big fan of Stephen's because of the Voice of America album. That was a big, big record for me, and it was really... The lyrics and uh, it was really moving and, and the same thing that Steve was doing with the Lords, you know, the truth is the sort of us all, you know, mm -hmm. telling the truth and raising questions, making writing relevant lyrics and really uh, with uh, which was the thing about punk and, uh, you know, with Bob Dylan back in the day, you know, telling the truth in people's face and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> That was inspiring to me. And uh, I thought, you know, Steve was the one who said, Michael, you know, start a solo career. And I thought, well, I guess so. <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and he, he encouraged me. And then when Steven came over, he, he had never heard of Hanoi Rock. So Steve showed him a video of, uh, I think it was Boulevard of Broken Dreams and something 
with Hanoi and, and uh, Steve was really like, wow, what is this band? He fell in love with this band. <laughs> mm -hmm. I realized he was a real rocker at heart, you know? Yes. <laughs> so so he uh, he was really interested in what I was doing and he's, he was supportive of my solo stuff from then on. And he came to play some 12 string acoustic on my demos that I was making at the time and sang some backing vocals. And then he was working on the Sun City project at the, mm -hmm. the same time. Yes. Five. So uh, he asked me and Steve to sing backing vocals on that. And then he flew us over to New York for the video. And that's when I decided I want to move to New York uh, and start restart my well, start my solo career there. And uh, that's where I stayed for the following 10 years in, in Manhattan and uh, I moved to East Third Street, across okay. the street from the Hells Angels. Mm -hmm. uh that that block and uh i lived there for 10 years and uh steamer was my best friend uh, was very supportive and uh whatever i was doing you know i'm not faking it he wrote me that song while you were looking at me and uh and we wrote dead jail rock and roll together and, and uh you know it was always always uh we were kept in touch and uh you know he became my best friend then so uh so there that's where it's our friendship started and uh right. I always wanted him to produce me, but uh, the record company wouldn't allow it. Uh, the big label, even though I was now, Did they to... say why they wouldn't allow it? It's because Stephen wasn't the flavor of the month at the time, I guess. Okay. It was like they had this heavy metal producer, uh, Michael Wagner, to produce sure. a project they had with Steve Stevens, which was a bad combination because uh, <laughs> those two were like... It took three months. I was in Guitar Hell in LA for three months with... Uh, those two, uh, and uh, I had a useless manager who uh, who, who rendered, rendered me powerless with in this situation. I couldn't. I tried to stop it, and I, nobody was supporting me. So I was just like, "Oh, this is a nightmare." And worst of all, the album came out, Jerusalem Slim. Jerusalem album. Slim, right? Yeah, which is like you know, black mark in my career because I always took, I, I always prided in making records that you know, uh, with the in, integrity and. Uh, uh, not uncompromising uh, quality stuff, and this was like now there was an album out that I totally hated, and uh, which is amazing because you would think yourself and Steve Stevens that's a great combination. I would think on paper it looks like it, yeah, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> you know? Good on paper, <laughs> yeah. Little did I know, it, those the, I guess the conflict in the end of it all was that, uh, as it turned out, uh, I, I play from the heart and he plays from the wallet, hmm. and that's Steve Stevens you're saying played from the wallet. Yes, he does. Interesting. Okay. The great. He's very talented, yep. but uh, uh, you know, as it turned out, he uh, he didn't share the same same vision in the end. I mean, he, he played great at first. Uh, we made demos for about a year, and then uh, then when it of course there was all these lawyers, guns, and money <laughs> before we <laughs> even started. It was like piles of contracts and everything. I didn't even care about. I just cared about music and. Uh, he played the kind of guitar he knew I liked, but then once we got into the studio, it was totally the other way. And he even started redoing Sammy Afa's bass parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, the drummer, poor drummer, Greg Ellis, uh, he was a good drummer, but uh, Steve started making everything so complicated that, you know, ripped the soul out of the, the stuff, you know, out of the record. And uh, it just took a wrong turn. And, uh, and then I tried to talk to him and he was like, oh, don't bother me, I'm gonna do my guitars here. Mm -hmm. And in the end of it all, after like staying in L.A. where I didn't even want to go originally, at the end of it all, when we got into the, there was the, the mixing process, I was kind of kind of hoping in the back of my mind that maybe maybe Stephen Wagner knew something I didn't know or something. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's all worthwhile. But then when it came to mixing, Steve comes up to me and says, hey, man, Michael Wagner's mixing it all wrong. I said, what? I thought you guys knew something. I don't know. Now you're telling me you don't see that. I don't know. Wait a minute. This is this is crazy. I mean, we, the use from day one, we got into the studio and you, you started going the other way, man. It's just like, this is not the demos. And when I said, what about the demos? It's, oh, it's, forget the demos. We're doing making the album now. So then at that point, I was like, you don't. So, so you don't agree with Wagner now? I was like, oh, this is crazy. We got to get back to New York. If we want to save this record, we're going to start all over, start from scratch and make it like the demos, you know, with two guitar parts. And he was going to have originally another guitarist too, because he knew I like the, you know, two guitar two rock guitar, songs. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which I guess he was never, never intended to do. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, so he said, okay. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> okay. So let's go back to New York and uh, start over. And we even had, this guy, um, uh, Bob Rosa, he was a good mixer. He he mixed uh, one song and uh, it sounded better already. 
and we would have to like redo because there, there are cool parts uh, in, uh, in certain songs. There were some two guitar parts which ended up being like the same part doubled, quadrupled like four times. And okay. and, and the days in the studio in LA, they were like, uh, Steve is such a great player. So they would do a guitar solo, one or two takes, and uh, I would go, that was great. That's it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, move mm -hmm. on. And Wagner, we, well, the producer, would say, oh, no, Michael, we're just adjusting the EQ now. Uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. And then go ahead, Steve. And then I do like 10 to 15 tracks of crazy, more and more like two hands on the neck, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. I was like, oh, my God. And then now do we have the solo after, so, you know, 15 tracks of that? Says, oh, no, now we do a comp. Oh, so you don't have one solo between all those? Now you're oh, going to combine man. them all? Okay. And that take an hour or two. And then now can we move on? No, now we go out to eat for dinner, <laughs> two or three hours of dinner. Right, like, right. Oh. But I'd rather give him the homeless money to the homeless. It ended up costing seven hundred over seven hundred thousand dollars, and it was my deal with Polygram Records. So right. I owed this money to the label, and before that, I I was still I already owed them uh, over a couple of hundred from uh, the previous uh, uh, from the not faking it album, mm -hmm. which they pulled a plug on. So uh, 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 once I, we had a disagreement over this, this advertisement that they had an ad on uh, TV that said, Michael Monroe, he's not faking it, uh, uh, except, uh, except no substitute. The brains behind Hanoi Rocks is back. And I was like, oh my God, mm. Hanoi Rocks had no brains. That was the cool <laughs> thing about the band. So I told him I disagreed with this commercial and, uh, and they said, oh, you don't like it? You want us to pull it? I said, yeah. And I thought they were gonna make a new one, but they didn't, they just, let the record die then. Mm. So that's what happened with that. So I already owed him a couple of hundred thousand. And after this uh, fiasco, I owed him a million. <laughs> so I had to get <laughs> off the label. And uh, it was just insane. So I, in the end, when Steve said, okay, we'll start over. So we went, came to New York and he was going to, you know, work with me and we'll start the record over. And it was already costing a ridiculous amount, but still I thought maybe we can still save it. But then uh, after uh, some time went by and I didn't hear from Steve and he had disappeared. And then I saw him on TV playing uh, guitar with uh, Vince Neil, and Marty right. Kruger was, st was starting his solo career. All of a sudden, he ended up with him. I, he left me with this. Which must have been death. a double whammy for you because we know the history with Vince Neil and your previous bands, right? So, oh, yeah, that, no, that too. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, of all the people. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Even though, I mean, I must say, I, I never blamed Vince Neil. I never met I the guy, you know, and, and I feel so fat, really bad for him uh, for the accident mm -hmm. and everything. It was this terrible thing to live with. But I mean, that was the irony of it all, you know, right. that that this person who was uh, involved in a, the, this past tragedy that happened, that, <laughs> that Steve ended up playing with, with just that, that of, guy. Of too. all people, right. <laughs> yeah, and, and that wasn't all. We had a song, there was a song called Downward Immobile, which um, I, I took off the album, uh, and but I had written it with Steve, and then Steve had that song. Uh, he had a chorus. The the chorus went, "You can't can't have your cake and eat it too." And there was a song on the Vince Neil album called "Can't Have Your Cake," which was that very same song, oh, except uh, uh, they had written. Uh, I guess Vince Neil had written some new lyrics on it, and the verses were different, which I didn't think were as good as the original, uh, personally. But so that song was originally going to be on your album, the Jerusalem on, Slim yeah, album. Yeah, Jerusalem Slim. And, and it was rewritten that, for that was Vince written Neil. by me and Steve. So now it was credited to Steve Stevens and Vince Neil. So he ripped off the song. Uh, and then uh, I had a publishing with, with Polygram. You know, it was like when I needed more money in the budget, not faking it. I was like, wait, sign a merchandise deal. Sign a mm -hmm. publishing deal. So, so I had, I was like, you know, all my eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And uh, since they had my publishing, they took 50% of everything. So I said... Why don't you now you got this guy who's a millionaire and now this uh, <laughs> I have the original demo. You can prove that this has ripped us off. Right. So why don't you go after him? No, then do nothing. So uh, and I said, OK, forget this. And uh, I was, you know, just fed up with the whole music business. Mu music had no business in the music business. And uh, uh, so I, I just thought, you know, obviously that project kind of ruined my chances of a big career in the States. And uh, mm -hmm. but I wasn't that concerned about that. I was more concerned about making a proper record a decent record that i could live with and be proud of mm -hmm. and uh that's therefore with the demolition 23 uh, record we did, made we did everything uh, right that went wrong with the uh, jerusalem slim fiasco well, well now <laughs> i could understand why you did the demolition 23 album in two weeks after that experience with jerusalem slim it's like total opposites like one was you know 
taking hours and hours just to get a guitar solo. And the other ones, hey, we could do this whole album in two weeks <laughs> in and yeah. out. So that, that's <laughs> awesome. That That is awesome. Now, one of the things also you, you talked about pulling some tracks from the Jerusalem Slim. The, did I hear this or read this right? That The Scum Lives On was also a song that was originally for Jerusalem Slim and then ended up on Demolition 23? Yeah, yeah, that was there's, there's even a version of that which uh, was really which re- really sucky uh, and uh, unfortunately the record company added that as a bonus track for mm-hmm. I think as European version of that right. album. But there we had Donald Trump in the lyrics originally, and <laughs> yeah, on, the only good thing about that version is that Donald Trump is on the on the scum on the list of the who's going to live forever. Donald Trump's going to live forever. We had Tip and, uh-huh. at the time, uh, and so so uh, that's the only thing. Uh, A blast that, from the past, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Donald Trump. Uh, we uh, that's the only only regret that uh, we didn't leave Donald Trump in the lyrics in the demolition mm-hmm. twenty three. There's some people who are not relevant anymore. Mm-hmm. In the list of, uh, but you know, you can uh, people can add their own uh, own favorite pet, pet hate <laughs> That's in, right. the, in the lyrics there. But yeah, that was one of the songs I took off the the album because, uh, and I thought let, let it be just a, a, a terrible heavy metal histrionics, uh, you know, two hands on the neck, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, Steve Stevens, you know, whatever he was trying to do, and obviously mm-hmm. he didn't know what he was doing in the end, anyway. So after all. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, goes the, it goes where the money is. Besides, I have heard also from uh, you know I don't want to slag the guy. You know he was we had some nice times too. Mm-hmm. Had some, some really nice times too, and uh, you know he had a good heart. He was well, was not an evil person, but he was a uh, you know he, he did a lot of things that made him look like a jerk in my eyes. But uh, he had done the same kind of thing to Phil Suzanne, you know the bass yeah, player. Bass player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, read read what he said about Steve because he mm. was in the same project and uh, Steve had done the same thing. He had taken Phil's songs and put his own mm. name under it. Mm. Okay, like that. so it's it's been known to happen apparently. But you know, he was a great player and it looked uh, good on paper. And he he approached me after hearing uh, the Not Faking It album and because uh, the Not Faking It was uh, recorded uh, uh, and produced by uh, with um, what's his name. Um, uh, Michael Frondelli was a mm-hmm. was a dear good good friend of mine, and he uh, yep. he was the engineer of uh, the Rebel Yell album, the Billy mm-hmm. Idol album. Yep. And I think he used some uh, some effect on the song "All Night with the Lights On" in the solo, the guitar solo, especially that Phil Grandy, who was God rest his soul, he was amazing. Mm-hmm. He was a, he was a real soulful player. He was totally true blue and and heartfelt and he lived every note he played it was i've never seen somebody being like on a higher ground in the studio he was he came up with he's, he's playing phenomenally on that record and that solo and all night with the lights on steve was kind of like it should be my solo man it sounds like mm-hmm. you know, i should be a guitar player and <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like well the guy looks the part you know i was like well you know Let's see what happens. And uh, then we started working on songs and he played rock and roll like it's supposed to. And uh, I turned him on to what I liked. And, uh, you know, for it was looking good. I mean, the demo sounded great. You can find those demos, by the way. Uh, there's a, uh, there was a CD that came out a long time ago called JS The Demos. Okay. J period, S period, The Demos, uh, which has that song Downward Immobile there as well, which okay. ended up being on that Vince Neil album. And, and that was at a point where it was looking promising. Mm. So you could hear what the album could have been okay. had it gone the right way. And had a little Steve and I, I, you know, the label said, ah, no, we can't have little Steve produce. And I said, what the hell? What happened to artistic control? And I went to Steve. <laughs> I said, you know, this, what the hell? You know, now they're not going to let me use the Steve, little Steve as a producer. And, and Steve was kind of like, well, maybe he's not a good at you know, he, he didn't support me in, my, in mm-hmm. that either. So okay. biggest mistake, and that's what ruined him. I mean, if Stephen had produced it, he would have, you know, kept Steve on the short leash, like like right. Keith, yeah. Forcey, like Keith Forcey did with uh, Billy Idol records. Sure, sure. You know, sure. He, he worked great when he was, on, uh, you know, in in doses. He was he was really fantastic in some stuff, you know. Yep. yep so, absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, the, think, thinking about the Demolition 23 album here for a yeah, moment, I, I like to put myself back in that time period, 1994, right? It was yeah. when the album came out. And I think of that time period, and of course, I think of punk was making a little bit of a resurgence at that time. You had Green Day on the radio. You had the well, Offspring. That, was coming, that came, yeah, was that, that came like later. I mean, it was a little bit later. Okay. 94, uh, Stephen was, uh, Stephen was, uh, he was shopping for a deal for Demolition 23. He was, uh, he tried to get, um, you know, get it signed, and uh, the, all the labels said, "Oh, punk is dead." Right. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, this is a history. You know, punk is dead, and it's not happening. And and they turned him down. Mm-hmm. And about a year later, you have Green Day and all this stuff happening. Right. 
right, right. it was like we were ahead of our time and once again i was like in the right place at the wrong time but you know <laughs> and that's what i was gonna say do you think this album was just slightly like a year too early because even there was bands like rancid ash that was in that punk rock type spectrum where yeah. where you were like one year too early i felt like maybe with that yeah exactly exactly one year too early and mm -hmm. and warrior soul also uh, Corey yep. clark he had the punk attitude he was <laughs> he made enemies of everybody because <laughs> he, he said is uh we had the same lawyer uh, in new york his name is michael guido and he, guido said to this uh, Corey, you've made enemies of everybody. You can't, you can't get any tours anymore because he was like, <laughs> he was too <laughs> honest about how he felt. And mm -hmm. but I love Corey. He, he lived one block away from me on Third Street, uh, above the Great Jones Bar and uh, the sure. Third Street Bowery. And I lived on the Los Angeles block. And we were best of friends, and uh, we really shared the same vision and uh, and the the punky, the you know, shaking up the establishment and telling the mm -hmm. truth. And you know, the, the first four uh, uh, Warrior Soul albums are still some of my favorite mm -hmm. records of all time. I actually played on uh, Chill Pill, the fourth album. I played some sax and harp on that, and uh, okay. that was the that was the screw you Geffen, let us go <laughs> uh, <laughs> album from them because mm -hmm. apparently uh, the Salutations from the Ghetto Nation album before that, which was on its way to becoming a big record, they they pulled a plug on that too for whatever reason, and uh, and Corey was uh, you know made it very obvious how he felt about mm -hmm. the label. Mm -hmm. Uh, publicly uh, and uh but yeah that was that was also a chorus chorus sings and backing vocals on uh, the gang vocals and demolition 23 album too i think it was in that scene it was, i was very tight with him too and um, we yeah we were us us against the world <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. now why was the was album good. the, the yeah. album was like i think it was only released in japan or there was a limited release of the album when it first came out do you know why that was the case uh, well, we didn't get it. Couldn't get a deal except for uh, uh, for Europe uh, Music for Nations. Uh, okay. That label released the album in in Europe, and uh, oh, and you, okay. yeah, and probably uh, somewhat limited amount because uh, uh, it was I was pretty quickly it was out of print and uh, mm -hmm. couldn't find it anywhere, and it was hard to find. Uh, Japan probably the most most amount was sold in Japan because uh, yeah. I think it sold a uh, uh, maybe. Uh, 20,000, 40,000, maybe something like that mm -hmm. in Japan, uh, which was at the time when records used to sell. It was, it was, <laughs> exactly. Because uh, I, I was, uh, my name, I had a good name in Japan and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and for that band, uh, we did a tour there and uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was happening over there. But the uh, rest of the world then, what happened was uh, Jay Henning, I mean, Jay was, he would have been a superstar. It's a shame what happened with him because uh, I, I met him at a at a jam once. We did um, this telephone bar and grill. It was uh, my local favorite uh, hangout at the uh, restaurant in uh, on Second Avenue between Ninth and Tenth Street. Uh, uh, and uh, we had a benefit for one of the waitresses was uh, seriously ill uh, over there. And uh, Jay came. To, we had a jam with me. I played with Tommy Price on drums and uh, Sammy Affa on bass and uh, Johnny Ray on one guitar who used to be in the David Johansson band mm -hmm. and uh, and Jay Henning on the other guitar. And I saw Jay and he had this snakeskin platform boots and, was, he, and he knew every Alice Cooper song, even the first two <laughs> albums of Alice wow. Cooper. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's going deep. So, yeah. And I was like, wow, this guy's something else. He would have been a superstar and it was fantastic. I mean, he could play... As a, as a four piece with just one guitar, he really filled the space when when he's doing solo. His he, he, his solos he, he played the way that covered the, covered the. It didn't feel like anything dropped out when he yeah. was doing his solos. So it was it was really really good good. And uh, unfortunately, he had some problems. He was well, he got hit by a car and uh, uh, he couldn't. Uh, uh, we had to wait for him to recover for many months. Uh, his leg was broken, and uh, then when he he had recovered, he he got busted in uh, alphabet city you know scoring because he had a bit of a habit and uh, mm -hmm. which uh, he was he was struggling with and uh, so it was just and that was just before the tour and uh, we were supposed to play in london and uh, and in finland and then go to japan and uh, you know it was just a couple of weeks before that and he couldn't get a, i got him out of you know uh, my lawyer helped him get off the uh so he didn't end up in rikers island but uh <laughs> thank god he would have been a very popular over there <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah that's very funny but uh yeah but he couldn't get a passport so unfortunately he couldn't join us for the rest of the tour so uh 
I, at the last minute, I got Nasty Suicide, uh, Hanoi Rocks, the other guitar player from Hanoi, yeah. to, to replace him. And we had like one rehearsal and then ended up playing the Astoria in London, which was mm -hmm. a great show. Mm -hmm. First time me, Sammy Alpha and Nasty had play, played together since Hanoi Rocks broke up. Right. Yeah, and that show was great. And then Nasty stayed, you know, till we went to Japan and stuff. And, and then we did another tour in 95. And uh, then, uh, however, Nasty decided to quit playing altogether and leave, to, re to leave rock and roll. And uh, since I didn't have a guitar player, we, I came back to New York and I thought, you know, uh, it was, I was kind of disillusioned and fed up with the business and uh, things weren't going anywhere. So I, I decided to move out of New York. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. it's time to move on. And I was planning to go to London at first, but then I ended up uh, uh, coming to Finland because my brother had, uh, he, he had a house in the country and he had fixed up this old house that uh, had been empty for, for 20 years. So I, I moved into the middle of nowhere, out of Manhattan, New York, in the middle of <laughs> nowhere in the <laughs> forest wow one extreme to the other and uh, i was just gonna say yeah exactly one extreme yeah a man of extremes so i guess but uh <laughs> yeah so but that was the end you know there was no interest uh, Stephen went to well, the well that really wasn't the end right because just a few weeks ago you guys played again for the first time in like 25 30 years right yes exactly how was That's that right. well it was great uh, i mean the idea came from when jimmy clark the drummer uh, was uh, who uh, remained a friend of mine throughout the years. Uh, who works for uh, Metallica? He's the drum tech for for uh, uh, Lars Ulrich, mm -hmm. and uh, he, um, uh, he he called me and, and said that uh, uh, he was going to come over to see the show, the my 60th birthday show, just just to see it uh, with his wife. And I says, "Whoa, that's great! Welcome!" And uh, then I figured, wait a minute, Sammy's going to be there, and Nasty's going to be there. Uh, Jimmy's going to come and says, well, why don't we do a Demolition 23 reunion and have Dem Demolition 23 the opening band, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, so the right. support. So then Jimmy said, oh, yeah, cool, great, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, is, uh, cause, and then Nasty, Nasty would, uh, Nasty was going to stay in Demolition 23 after, you know, he decided uh, during the tour in, in 94 that, yeah, he was going to be a permanent member. So I thought, okay, I was not going to say no because Jake mm -hmm. the tour. So he was kind of like the guitar player. So then, uh, we, we thought that was going to be cool. And Jimmy kept texting me as well. Wow, we're going to kick ass. It's going to be great. And then uh, a few weeks before the show, uh, Jimmy had a, uh, heard from uh, the Metallica people that they had a show come up in New York. Some uh, which was going to be televised or something on the 24th, which was the day after you know, the 23rd. It was my birthday gig at the, right. the Ops Hall in Helsinki. So then uh, I said, can you get someone to sub? And he was, it was he had somebody he had uh, that uh, even Lars had said it's okay for him for uh, to uh, sit in for him for that for for the twenty third and then Jimmy was going to be uh, able to fly back the morning of the twenty fourth and you know he would only miss one day which wasn't mm -hmm. even a big day but apparently the management said that no that they wanted him they wanted Jimmy to be there so I says oh that's that's a bummer mm -hmm. so but then I thought. That's such a great idea. That let's do it with uh, my current drummer, with, with um, my drummer Carl Rockfist, and who was great, of course. Right. And uh, right. and he already we've been playing some of those songs live already anyway. So uh, I said, yeah, let's do it with Carl. So it was Carl Rockfist and Sammy Alpha, me and and Nasty, and uh, That's it awesome. was great. Yeah, we played five songs, and it was like the, the support band. It was a great idea. So we could uh, <laughs> do those songs in the beginning of the whole set because they're. I did stuff from my, uh, uh, apart from that, I did stuff from my old solo stuff and then my current solo band with, uh, with, with Ginger Wildheart and, uh, and Dragon, you know, all the different phases with the three different guitar player changes and, uh, yep. and Rick Jones in the end. And then they all came up and we did their trail rock and roll. And then uh, had the, the, the rebirth of Hanoi. We had that with uh, you know, about three songs. And then in the end, uh, the original Hanoi lineup, uh, Jip Casino, the original drummer, yep. we, who had, we haven't been together since about well, 40 years ago. So mm -hmm. that was a, it was a memorable night. All the phases of my career were presented here. And uh, Demolition Tway, we played uh, not, Nothing So Right, Dysfunctional, Endangered Species, and You Crucified Me in Hammersmith Palais. And mm -hmm. that was killer. It was great, great set. And some people said, oh, they wish it had been more because it was, it was some, some people's favorite part of the show. You know, mm -hmm. you, know you, you just mentioned you crucified me. And to me, like you listen to this album 
And the album is certainly influenced on Ramones, Sex Pistols, that type of, you know, 70s punk. But the song You Crucified Me always kind of stood out as like, it's, I don't want to call it a pop rock song because it's not pop rock, but it's it's not as punk as the other songs on the album to me. Maybe it's just me. What do you remember about that song and writing that song? Am I totally off base? You could tell me I'm crazy. That's okay. But that oh, song always stood out as like stylistically a little bit different than the rest of the album. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's stylistically, it's, it's different. It's it's not the hard pounding punk and uh, right. it's it's a it's a big um uh, it's it's variation is it's, it's very different from the rest of the stuff and that's even more of a reason to have it there because yeah. it's, if it's like relentless punk pounding in your face <laughs> all the time you get kind of numb after a while you, yeah. you, know, you know, <laughs> dynamics you know yeah so that song was uh and also the last song dead time stories that's mm-hmm. very different sure. you know, that's very that's mm-hmm. written for steve baders so i'll get, get to that in a minute but uh you crucified me i i had that verse for quite a while i would had it for for many years actually and then steven came back uh, came by my place uh, around the time when we were writing those songs and he had, he had gotten the idea for for the chorus and in, in, uh, in a cab and it was on his way over and he says i don't know if this is going to work but this could be something and, and it played the chorus idea and i was like wait a minute that fits perfectly now with this 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 <laughs> verse i have it that, yeah and he says are you sure he says, yeah 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 it's going to be great you crucified me perfect with the lyrics and everything and, and uh, it so those put those together and uh it's one of my favorites it's really mm-hmm. and, and especially with steven singing the harmonies on, on the verse and, yep. and the chorus yep. and i thought it was really cool and then it turned out great and uh we were like uh set on having everything be punk you know so to speak <laughs> right, right, right hard rock and rock and roll and it was and that that's also it was authentic that it wasn't like me me trying to be punk because the punk thing has always been part of me but it's always like to me like i said rock and roll is about taking the establishment and telling the truth and and uh, being rebellious in a in a in a uh, constructive way so so to me i was like you know the punk uh that uh, not wanting to be labeled you know i'd mm-hmm. rather you know i hannah rocks always defied all categories and that's one of the best things sure. about the band is that so uh, absolutely, I didn't want to be restricted to that kind of punk thing. So mm-hmm. it was nice, nice uh, variation and uh, nice dynamics in the for the entire team. Agreed. After Agreed. that, kicking back into was it Endangered Species or something? Uh, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, right, so you right. have little dips here and there. And the daytime stories that song has, uh, I think, about eleven uh, title uh, Steve Bader's song titles within the lyrics. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know. Uh, uh, any fun, ain't nothing to do. Partners in crime, dead and alive, uh, ready anytime. Uh, uh, last year, make up your mind. It's cold outside. Dreams and desires, uh, ain't nothing. I mean, it was uh, all from throughout Steve Bader's career. And when he passed away, I I had those chords from actually. Mm. I'd had those chords when I uh, I was li- living with Steve uh, in '85 in London, and uh, I was playing them one day and then Steve started kind of humming the melody a little bit and mm-hmm. I said, oh, that's cool huh and I had had a different chorus for it but uh but then Steve was um um I played you know I called it um hold on a second yeah sure I called it uh uh so it was going to be a love song uh uh I was I called it the Star Crossed Lovers and I, I played it to Steve when I was living in uh, New York in the uh, Hotel Iroquois and he said that song's about us isn't it I said really oh, oh yeah maybe <laughs> it is, maybe it is. Mm-hmm. and then but he had also taught me how to when we lived together in London he was encouraging me to start my solo career and he showed me uh how to like take a chorus from another song like the chords from another song and make it into a different song like the the art of sort of borrowing a part from the song. <laughs> so he had uh he had the, uh, uh, the grassroots song, Where Were You When I Needed You? So he said, he, he sang in these words, just, please don't you go, don't you know, got to stay with me. The same chords, but a different melody. And, it, and he used those words, that's why those lyrics are in the song. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I decided to when Steve died after I heard the news he, he, uh, of his death, I uh, sat down. I was sad, and I was like, I started playing. Them. Now you left me too. 
ain't it fun, ain't nothing to do. And that's how the song came, uh, you know, I wrote it kind of with, and he, I felt his presence, his spirit was definitely there when I was sitting there. And uh, so we wrote the song after his passing, he was mm -hmm. on the other side, and uh, that's how that came together. And, uh, and that's my heartfelt tribute to Stiv. And uh, I'm pretty proud of that, actually, the way it came together with the, and all the, all the his song titles within the lyrics, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So that was my, my tribute to my dear friend. And, uh, and also, uh, one of the coolest things was when, uh, I, uh, when I went to L.A. to work with Guns N' Roses and, uh, and uh, Axel had told me on the phone that he hadn't heard much of the Dead Boys, so I made him a tape of the Dead Boys, which we were listening to in his car uh, at one point in, uh, in Hollywood. And then he heard Ain't It Fun? And he said, oh, man, we got to do this song. And uh, mm -hmm. this was, they were doing the... Uh, Spaghetti, spaghetti incident, incident mm -hmm. at the moment yeah at the time same time as they were doing the um uh user illusion album on which i came which i was i had come to play saxophone and harmonica on so then we did that as a duet for a stiv and i was like i didn't want any money of that either i said i don't want any i just wanted to be end up on the album and because mm -hmm. uh, some of those bands they covered uh i heard that some of these guys had got a little greedy and stuff and i says i didn't want <laughs> i didn't even want any money i just wanted it to say in memory of Steve Bader's and to spell my name right. That's all. Well, it goes back to what you said earlier with it's for you is about the music, not the business, right? So when you're talking about Steve Stevens and you and the difference, right? So here you are, you're going to be recording on one of the biggest albums of all time, right? Use Your Illusion. You've got um, Bad Obsession, which you, you recorded on, yeah. and then you're on Ain't It Fun, and you're not even concerned. Like, it blows my mind. You're like, I don't even care about the money. I just want to be on the album. <laughs> you know, that, that's, uh -huh. yeah, that says yeah. a lot about what's important to you. That's right. That's true. And then to have people see Steve's name, all the all the millions of their fans are going to see Steve's name. So mm -hmm. that was like best thing I could do for my friend. Yeah. Right, right, right. That that's awesome. Now you know, just staying with Guns N' Roses for a moment, right? So you had Slash on your most recent solo album as well, right? Playing a guitar yeah. solo, right? So okay. when, when was the last time you spoke to all the guys? Obviously, Slash more recently, but do you still stay in contact with the guys? Yeah, Slash and uh, and Duff mostly, and uh, uh, Slash is such a sweetheart. I mean, he did that solo in a couple of days after I asked him and I know he was really busy and, uh, and uh, we got, we're making a video of that too, that, that oh, song. Yeah. He's probably, he said he, he he's uh, willing to be on the video too, to do, play the solo. I mean, you know, nice. obviously <laughs> nobody do that. so, so yeah, sweetheart, you know, really, really nice guy. And uh, uh, he's always stayed the same. Uh, and really, I'm so glad that they're still going because I, mm -hmm. I think they're really great. And uh I think uh, Axel's singing fine, you know, he's doing great. Uh, we opened for them in London last uh, June. I mean, yeah, July, sure. you know, July. And uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, um, I think that was fantastic. You know, uh, I know they canceled a gig after that uh, in uh, Glasgow because of voice problems, but I thought they were singing great and I think they were really good. So I'm so glad that they're still going because uh, they play rock and roll and rock and roll bands these days, this day and age are still like really, really rare and uh, really, uh, uh, really sad about the uh, Taylor Hawkins because I mean, Foo Fighters are mm -hmm. obviously one of the greatest bands in the world ever. And I'm so glad that they're being around for so long too because they play the right kind of music. And, and their guitar play has pointed to you as an influence, right? As, as uh, somebody who has... Uh, was inspired by Hanoi Rocks. And it's like, that blows my mind. It's like, cause you guys got a lot of credit, obviously for the eighties. And I know you don't like the, the fact you got a lot of credit for the eighties hair metal scene, right? But then here it is years later, the guitar play from the Foo Fighters is also pointing to you and your band as an influence. Chris Yeah, Yes, exactly, Chris, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's great, yeah. He was in a band called the Lost Kittens and they were, were, they opened up for me and uh, Not Faking It Tour in 89 yep. in, in Santa Barbara. And, uh, he's a really sweet guy and uh, yeah, really, he says great things about Hanoi. And yeah, obviously I didn't want to be uh, associated with the hair metal bands because <laughs> the, the posers who played their hairspray cans better than their instruments. And uh, that's just like, I was more scared <laughs> about rock and I wasn't all, all about this posing and partying and, you know, mm -hmm. sex, drugs, rock and roll cliche. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason I didn't want to be associated with that. But uh, of course, uh, all kinds of, uh, and, you know, uh, admiration is, is uh, flattering and stuff, especially with bands who get it right, you know, right. and that get their own thing. I mean, even the guy from uh, Slipknot, you know, the guy with the long nose is a uh -huh. Pinocchio nose or whatever. It is. Yep. He, we were, I was watching a show in 2010 in Finland at a festival, and he all of a sudden he comes to us on the side of the stage and says, Hey, you, your fault, I'm doing this. 
She was like, oh, tag me, you look so dangerous. Says, hey, man, the first album I had was Back to Mr. City. And then he's uh, pulling uh, Corey Taylor, the singer. It's like, hey, look who's here. Oh, Michael Monroe's watching that show. So, I mean, the kind of music they have is you would never guess that right. they, were, they were inspired by Hanoi. And those guys, it was really, I was like, wow, this is the greatest, you know, because they, they totally had their own thing. You know? mm-hmm. you know, wow, that was, that was scary. <laughs> people were coming out, they were taking people out of there in ambulances with broken bones and stuff. You oh, know? Wow. <laughs> oh, man, crazy. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's 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 great. And uh, Chris Shefflett, he's uh, actually there's a movie in the making, my documentary movie of my life uh, called it's yep. going to be called uh, the best kept secret in rock and roll. And uh, we have some <laughs> great stuff. We, we just uh, filmed with uh, little Steven and uh, right, you were uh, in yeah, New York last week, right? Yeah, last week. Yeah, we did. We had a cool interview with little Steven and I went to see Ian Hunter in Connecticut and uh, had a nice chat with him. And mm-hmm. we have Alice Cooper from the end of the summer. I opened up for Alice for like seven shows in June and it was it was really, really cool. So I had a uh, uh, really, um, uh, really great. So I, I let him talk most of it. He's telling this cool stuff from their early years. And uh, uh, it's going to be an exceptional documentary movie which is, uh, as it has happened. Uh, when do you think that's going to come out? It's going to come out in uh, the end of January, it looks like now. Okay. Next year. Yeah, it's almost. And, almost and you said it's called The Best Kept Secret in Rock and Roll? Yeah. It's Which funny. I love that title because it's so appropriate, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, right. You think so? Totally. Totally. Cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you this. So going back to the Hanoi days for a moment, right? So one of the things I love is that you guys were working with Bob Ezrin at the time, right? Al yeah. Cooper, he's Kiss. Been, he's been interviewed for the documentary, too. Awesome. So I was going to ask you if he was going to be in the documentary. What was it like working with him? Right. Because we've heard a lot of stories about Bob and what he's like in the studio. So what was it like? Fantastic. For you guys? He's great. It was great with us. Uh, it was a great learning experience. Yeah, we, we learned a lot and he uh, he had a great sense of humor, too. And, uh, you know, he ran a tight ship, but uh, it wasn't uh, it was it was he loved our band and he it was going to be a long, long relationship. We, we were going to make more records with him, too, mm-hmm. uh, in the future. And uh, if uh, had not not been for the accident and right. Russell was really upset about the, that whole thing when Russell died. And uh, it was really because he was he felt about us like he felt about the Alice Cooper band. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, we had plans. So we were planning to work with him in the future albums, too. And it would have been a great, fruitful relationship because uh, we learned a lot. That's when we became sort of professionals when we were. Right. Right. It was right. fantastic. And and he has spoken highly. My, he said about my last album, he says, Michael, Michael's made it now. He said in the interview, he said that the, my last record, that uh, my, now Michael's made it. He's, he's there. That this is- <laughs> That's awesome. Great to That's hear from awesome. you. No. And we were talking before at your birthday party, Demolition did a, a reunion show. Is there any chance that you guys would do another one-off show or a couple of other shows anywhere else? With Hanoi, uh, with, with uh, you mean Demolition 23? Yeah, with Demolition yeah, 23. Yeah, I, I would be up for it, um, especially with Carl Rockfist being available on drums uh, and, and uh, Nasty Suicide also being, uh, you know, uh, willing to. He was he's really excited about it, too. Mm-hmm. So we're all up for it if, uh, if there's such a opportunity or if there's some some event that uh, that would be you know uh, desired we'll be willing to do it yeah Up and i that. know you said that you don't want to revisit the hanoi rocks and i could understand that's probably a, a little bit of a yeah. sore spot but would you ever see another one-off type show or anything like that no uh, for hanoi rocks the original hanoi lineup uh, this was just a one-off yeah no no plans for any other gigs like that no. Now, so you said that was a lot of fun. So why wouldn't you do another one? Right. Because you were so excited. It seemed like afterwards, oh, that was a blast. It was so much fun. Well, the, the whole night, the whole night was such okay. a blast. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was, that was just one part of it. And that it was it was great to do it once. But mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, do uh, more of that. It was it was too special. I said, unless we got a million dollars each. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Then you'll listen, right? <laughs> promoters, any promoters watching, there you have it. A million dollars each. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I mean, that was, that, was, that was too special to be like, you know, to do it. And uh, yeah, and uh, it was it was really, that was a real cool. It was it was totally perfect to have all the phases of my career and, and, and that thing coming together. Because, I mean, Jeep Casino was going to be there for, for another song originally. And then I realized that Andy was going to be there and Zip and everybody's. And I was like, wait a minute, mm-hmm. what about this? And then it was going to be a surprise, be a surprise. But then I realized that it would be, fans would be pissed if they know ahead of time. So we <laughs> sure. that's conference and uh, we let, let people know ahead of time. So that was a cool as a one off. It's uh, too special uh, to, uh, to do it again. But the Demolition 23, we could do a few shows. So I'll be up for that. 
That'd be that's cool. awesome. We'll have to definitely take a keep an eye out for that. So the album's coming out or being re-released, I should say, in a couple of days. Like you said before, it's the first time it's ever on vinyl, right? And it's a lot of times, a lot of places will be the first time it's available. Um, how can people find the album? Is it going to be digital, digital downloads it's and stuff? A, it's digital. It's on vinyl and all the platforms it's supposed to be on. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, CD and, and vinyl, first time on vinyl ever. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and on CD and the fee bonus tracks as well. And it's on Spotify and every other platform is supposed to be available there. Yeah. And when you listen, what would be your format format of choice? Do you go to vinyl? Do you stream music, download? How do you listen to music? Uh, I don't I don't have Spotify. I, I, I do. I, I listen to CDs still. And uh, uh, my laptop, I have uh, iTunes. Uh, all my favorite records up in there. So yep. uh, I listen to and, and on my phone. Uh, just my favorite record, so I, I don't I don't use the uh, the you know Spotify and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. uh, I have my I mostly listen to uh, records from the past, uh, some new stuff too, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, I have my iTunes uh, compilation, and then I make compilations and stuff. And my favorite. Yep. Record. Yep. Same here. So when you look back to that period, 1994, and this album being recorded and, and coming out, what comes to your mind most when when you look back to 94 at that time period? Well. The point that it's uh, it's all very relevant to this day, even today, when you listen to that record, it's very relevant. And that's I'm happy about that because uh, I like rock and roll. The best rock and roll is timeless. And uh, I, I believe I've done something uh, special there and uh, that still is is uh, still still holds water. It still is a great record and kicks ass and it's, it's relevant to, in this day and age. So I'm quite happy about that and that I managed to keep my career going. Uh, all this time and uh, has maintained my integrity and, and never sold out, never sold my soul for the wrong reasons. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been easy, but I've come this far and I'll go the rest of the way. And, uh, you know, I live too fast to die young. Uh, the, most, the recent albums I made, especially the last one, is some of the best stuff in my career. And uh, I'd rather be that guy than uh, some, somebody who's had a hit in the 80s and just keeps revamping the old stuff. You know? mm -hmm. so well, you said it before, the best kept secret in rock and roll. And this album to me is one of the best kept secrets of rock and roll and certainly of the decade because you go and you listen to it. And it just sounds so, from beginning to end, it's so great. Such a great album. So anybody watching or listening and you haven't heard the record, if you like punk, if you like the Ramones, if you like the Cess Pistols, if you like anything Michael's done in the past, you're going to absolutely love this record. It's it just, a, it's a powerhouse from beginning to end. You got the bonus songs now, some of the demos on there. So um, very well worth checking out. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Anything else, Michael, you want your fans to know before we wrap up here? Just wanted to uh, thank them for all the support and uh, the patience because I haven't been able to play as much as I would have wanted to play, like in, space, in the States especially, but hopefully we'll see it on the road very soon. And uh, yeah, check out this record. And it's like some of the my favorite records as well. One of the, some of the best kept secrets in rock and roll. You, there you go. There. You look for them, you find them. This is one of them. Well, we'll look for the record. We'll look for the video with Slash that you said you record in. Um, we'll look for the documentary in January. There's, it sounds like there's no stop in the future for you. No stopping. That's right. I keep awesome. Going. Awesome. Well, thank you so much today for your time, Michael. I really appreciate it. Best of luck thank with you. everything. And uh, we hope Great to see you soon. You. See you soon. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty. There you have it. I'd like to thank Michael Monroe for joining me, talking all about the upcoming new re-release of the Demolition 23 album, as well as what it was like to work with Stevie Van Zandt and much more. That was a lot of fun, Michael. Thank you so much. Anybody who's watching or listening and hasn't heard the album, go check it out. You won't be disappointed. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.